Hello! Uh, this video lecture will cover the part two of chapter one, specifically focusing in on research and some of the great researchers of sociology. So let's look at where sociology began. And it started in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is the 17 and 1800s, during a period called the Enlightenment. Um, Europe, which is where the Enlightenment really flourished, um, had an enormous uh, influence on the development of sociology. The Enlightenment was characterized by the belief in human reason to solve society's problems, meaning if you thought about it long enough, you could probably figure out how to solve a problem. Intellectuals believed that there were natural laws in society to be discovered and used for the general good. So the concept here is that these laws already exist, they're part of nature, and if a human studies them, they'll be able to find the patterns that create or ultimately lead to a law that um, is part of nature. So let's look at some of the great sociological minds um, from history. We have Auguste Comte, a French philosopher who coined the term sociology and believed sociology could discover the laws of human social behavior and help solve society's problems. This approach is called positivism. Very important word. Hint, hint, know what I mean. A system of thought in which scientific observation is considered the highest form of knowledge. In other words, going through the scientific method, observing how groups interact, and being able to make conclusions or um, ask additional questions. Then we move on to Alexis de Tocqueville, a French citizen who traveled to the United States in 1831. Tocqueville thought democratic values positively influenced American institutions and transformed personal relationships. Keeping in mind that in the early 1800s, we're not seeing a lot of societies out there that um, were democratic. You know, most of the countries in the world were led by totalitarian leaders, either dictators, czars, kings. So this democratic thing the United States did was still relatively new. He did, however, feel that despite an emphasis on individualism, Americans had little independence of mind, making them self-centered and anxious about social position. Because again, if you are living in a society where you are born into the lower classes and there's a king, you're pretty much going to stay in the lower classes for the rest of your life. Whereas in the United States, because of democracy, the idea is that all of us are equal. And because all of us are equal, we can each move up that financial ladder and achieve great success. With success comes social position. So he saw democracy as counterproductive in a way. Then we have Harriet Martineau one of the earliest observers of American culture, Harriet Martineau used the powers of social observation to record and analyze the social structure of American society. Um, and this is just being somebody who pays attention and looks at the details and understands the way group activity works. And, you know, with that kind of a context, this was something that people had been doing for years. You know, if you go back to the early 1800s and late 1700s when Jane Austen was writing in England, she is well known for analyzing the social structure within the fictional novels she wrote. But Harriet Martineau was actually writing these things down for people to study. 
Then we have Emil Durkheim, which we'll talk about much later in the semester in more detail. And he established the significance of society as something larger than the sum of its parts. So if you think about a human being, we have two arms, two legs, ten fingers, ten toes, a head, but the totality of a human being is so much more than that. And that's the same thing that Durkheim was saying about society, is that it's not just the 300 million people who live in the United States, but rather our sense of how we see ourselves as Americans. Then we move into Karl Marx, and Karl Marx um, is one of the most famous economic critics of all time. Um, and his work led eventually to communism. However, um, when he analyzed capitalism as an economic system with implications for how society is uh, organized, in particular, how inequality between groups stem from economic organization of society. In other words, the people with money have more than the people who don't have money. And this inequality then spreads to political power, it spreads to buying power, it spreads to our ability to access things, and it spreads to all aspects of our lives. So Marx was convinced that capitalism was in fact a um, destroyer of society, of equality, which is ironic because in our American dem democratic society, which emphasizes equality to such a high level, we are also a capitalist society. And if you pay attention to the news, you'll know that there are a lot of conversations going on about how much wealth is concentrated with such a few people and how the vast majority of people in the United States are living below middle income these days. Then we have Max Weber, who interpreted the economic, cultural, and political organization of society as together shaping social institutions and social change. So in other words, it's not just economics, it's not just the culture, but it's economics, culture, and politics that shape our society. Most of you will probably have heard of Charles Darwin. He is the British scholar who identified the process of evolution by which species are created through survival of the fittest. Or in other words, how well we adapt to the various changes in society. Social Darwinism conceived of a society as an organism. Remember we talked about how early sociologists saw the world as an organism in and of itself that evolved in a process of ad adaptation to the environment. So we're not just talking about trees and grass, but the environment of business, the environment of government, the environment of our social and cultural institutions. They believed that evolution always leads to perfection and assumed the current arrangements in society are inevitable because we're moving towards, and to quote our American forefathers, a more perfect union. And again, there's a lot of you know, disagreement about this because of the way corruption has a way of insinuating itself in society and undermining this concept. The Chicago School was characterized by thinkers who were interested in how society shaped the mind and identity of people. They thought of society as a human laboratory where they could observe and understand human behavior to be better able to address human needs. And they used the city in which they lived as a living laboratory. So you had a whole bunch of people who were interested in society and how society is shaped all come together in Chicago to develop this laboratory where the entire population was a potential subject. And by watching these groups from the very poor to the very rich, they could see the changes in how society existed um, at the various levels. 
Robert Park was a researcher from the University of Chicago, and he was interested in how racial groups interacted. Um, He was fascinated by the sociological design of cities, noting that cities were sets of concentric circles. At the time, the very rich and the very poor lived in the middle, and they are ringed by slums and low-income neighborhoods. This is before the suburbs were actually a thing. So, you know, we're not looking at the suburbs being further out in that concentric circle, but eventually they did get that way. So, just to kind of give you some examples here. Think about London in England. London existed under the ancient Romans. So, London was known as Londinium 2,000 years ago, and it was a small little settlement, and over the years, it grew bigger and bigger. So, it started in the middle, and then it would just expand like a balloon that you're blowing up. And the very rich lived in the very center of the town where the businesses were and they had very nice houses. And then who's going to work in these businesses and manufacturing plants? Well, those are the poor. The poor also lived in the center, but they lived in the slum areas and the ghetto areas. So what we see here is this mingling, but still the separation between the classes. Jane Addams is the only sociologist to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Addams used sociology to try and improve people's lives, especially women's lives. She created what's known as the Settlement House Movement, which provided social services to groups in need, as well as a social laboratory in which to observe problems. And if you think of the modern day concept of a group home for people with learning difficulties or um, developmental disabilities, people who are alcoholics or addicts who live in sober houses, this settlement house or this group house concept was literally developed by Jane Addams. W.E.B. Dubois is one of the first sociologists to use community studies as the basis for sociological work, and we'll talk more about community studies as we go along in this class. Dubois' work is seen as a brilliant and lasting analysis of the significance of race in the United States. The United States is a very diverse country, and we have a lot of different cultures living here. The one major diversity issue that seems to plague the United States is race, whether you're African American, Hispanic, Caucasian, Asian. There has been racial issues since literally the beginning of the um, United States. Now, just to kind of go over a few more uh, terms that we want to make sure you understand, we have the word social order. And social order is this idea that when it just seems like there's a mass confusion, there's still order in it. Um, One of the goals of sociological research is to discover the processes involved in creating such order. A lot of us, when we were kids, we would sit and we would watch an ant pile, and we'd watch how the ants scurried about and worked together, and ants are well known to be good workers. Um, And, you know, we would be fascinated by this. Well, this is what sociologists do. They will watch a community of people or a group of people to find how they achieve their social order. Now we're going to move on to the research process and you have to understand and if you remember from the first lecture sociology is an empirical science meaning that it has to follow the scientific method. First you develop the general theory then you have your research question you have to decide how are you going to Um, you know, what question are you going to investigate? The research design, you have to design the research project. Then you collect the data, you analyze the data, 
and you come to conclusions. Well, a lot of times those conclusions lead to other theories and so on. So the process is very cyclical and in some instances it may never end because the deeper we get, the more we parse out the information, the more we learn about society. A few topics that you should understand. Um, replication studies um, are research that is repeated exactly but on a different group of people or in a different time or place. A replication study can tell you what changes have occurred since the original study and may also refine the results of the earlier work. And this next bullet is so absolutely important. Research findings should be reproducible. If research is sound, researchers will repeat a study and they should get the same results. If a study is not reproducible, it is oftentimes debunked um, and they look at what potentially could have been wrong with the study. Another word we all need to know is hypothesis and you may know this word from bio or chem but it is a tentative assumption that a researcher plans to test. Hypotheses are often formulated as if-then statements. So, for example, if a person's parents are racially prejudiced, then that person will, on average, be more prejudiced than a person whose parents are free of prejudice. So, that's the hypothesis. How we measure that? we would interview two groups of people one group who were raised by very prejudiced parents one group who was not raised by prejudiced parents we collect the data and then we analyze it and we see if that is in fact true then we have variables an independent variable is one the researcher wants to test as hypothesized cause of something else the dependent variable is one on which there is a hypothesized effect. So if x is the independent variable, then x leads to y, the dependent variable. So this little picture down here might make this a little more clear. So the cause or the independent variable, and then the effect or the outcome, and that is the dependent variable. Also, studies need to be reliable, and reliability means that if a measurement is repeated, the measurement gives the same result. So, if you have a ruler and you're measuring a line and you measure it and it says it's 8 inches, and then three days later you come back with the same ruler and you measure the same line and it comes out as 5 inches, you know it's not reliable. Reliable means that a measurement can be trusted. And there are two ways to ensure reliability. One, use measures that have proved sound in past studies. And two, have a variety of people gather the data to make certain results are not skewed by the tester's appearance, personality, etc. And if you remember the video we looked at, um, the, bicycle, the stealing the bicycle study, you'll remember that Depending on the thief's appearance, being either African American male, white male, or young, pretty blonde woman, um, there were many differences in how people related to that. So, in the same way, if you have somebody who's, you know, asking questions, and they have a certain appearance, that could can in fact skew how the person is answering the questions. So, for example, if someone is talking about bullying and they're being interviewed by someone that they find very attractive and they're asked if they've ever bullied someone, they may not admit it because they want to impress the person and not repel them. We also have something called samples and populations, and this is often the groups sociologists want to study are so large that research on the whole group is impossible. To construct a picture of the entire group, they take a data from a subset, and a sample is any subset of a population. 
A population is a relatively large collection of people that a researcher wants to study. These researchers then make generalizations based on these studies. So, for example, the United States has 300 million people, give or take a few, and let's say you're studying homosexuality, which they estimate 8 to 10 percent of the population is gay. So that takes you to 30 million people in this country, give or take. That is far too large of a number to study. However, if they decide instead to study 3,000 people or 30,000 people, that's going to be a nice big subset of the population. The other thing is that if you see a population that's incredibly small, like if instead of studying 3,000, they're going to study 30 or worse yet, three, you know the sample size is way too small. Another term, and again, some of you may already know this, so I apologize if it's um, repetitious, but a percentage is the same as parts per hundred. So when we say that 23.9% of Americans are Roman Catholic, this tells you that for every 100 people randomly selected from the population, approximately 23 or 24 will be Roman Catholic. And if you look over here, you know, Protestant, about 51 or half the people in the United States. Um, Jews, 1.7, so between 1 and 2 people per 100. Buddhist Muslims, about one person per hundred. Hindu, one person in 20. Um, interestingly, no religion is 16%, so that's a fairly large number of people who practice no religion in this country. Correlation. This is one of those things that people get very confused about. So we're going to talk about this on repeated situations. Correlation is a widely used technique for analyzing the patterns of association or correlation between pairs of variables, such as income and education. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a cause and effect. Rather, it is a correlation in the sense that you see things moving in the same direction. So, positive correlation. One of the most famous positive correlations is the more education you have, the more money you make. So, if you figure this is someone who's a high school dropout and this is someone who's a lawyer or a doctor, you'll see that the more education, the more money you'll make. Now, a negative correlation means that you have a similar situation, but it's the opposite. So, it's the idea is that your um, negative correlation, the numbers are going to reflect no connection in terms of things moving together, but rather they are moving in a way that associates. So kids who don't get vaccines are more likely to get sick. So, you know, this is lack of vaccines, more likely to get sick. And the more kids that are vaccinated, the less likely they are to get sick. Then we have a no correlation, which is just a rather random scattergram that doesn't show us anything. Oftentimes you'll find statistical errors, and two of the big ones is citing a correlation as a cause. A correlation reveals an association between things, but it does not necessarily indicate that one thing causes the other. Overgeneralizing is when statistical findings are limited by the extent to which the sample group represents the population from which the sample was ob obtained. This is when you would have such a small number of people being looked at that it is absurd. Um, one of the most famous statistical errors ever is the idea that vaccinations can cause autism, the MMR vaccination. And one of the things that they um, looked at was the sample size. Now, they looked at literally 
less than 12 kids out of all of the autistic children in the world. So 12. 12 is not a good sample size. And from that 12, four were discounted immediately for various reasons. And then they just really looked at eight. So the sample size was so small and it didn't prove anything. And the medical journal that published the article had to retract it. But it has caused thousands of children not to get vaccinated and has caused chaos in terms of children dying from diseases that were eradicated 25, 35, 45 years ago. Another issue is when a sample population for a study about the USA, for example, is not diverse and it will skew the results because the USA is a very diverse nation. So if we're doing a study on people in the United States, drinking, drugging, teenage sex, and we only look at Ten teenagers who live in North Dakota, and that's a very white state, it is not representative of the entire country. So how do they do the things they do? Well, sociologists use a variety of tools, including questionnaires, interviews, participant observation, controlled experiments, content analysts, historical research and evaluation research. One of the more interesting aspects is something called participant observation. Now there's also something called non-intrusive observation which is where the sociologist will just watch somebody but a participant observation is somebody who actually becomes both a participant in and an observer of that which they are studying. And you often see anthropologists do this. They go and they live with tribes to better understand the culture and the traditions and the rituals of that particular tribe. Controlled experiments are highly focused ways of collecting data, especially useful for determining a pattern of cause and effect. Two groups are created. An experimental group is exposed to the causal factor one is examining, and the control group is not. All other conditions are equal for both groups. So take a look at these little plants down here, and this is very reminiscent of my middle school science fair project, where I bought two plants from the same store, same plant, same dirt, same everything, same pot. And what I did was I took the control plant and I watered it. And then for the experimental plant, I used soda to water it, not water. And to see if the experimental plant would grow faster, um, which was my hypothesis. And by the way, I was proved wrong. Um, and so we look at these things. So all things must be equal except for that one causal factor. Lastly, we're going to look at evaluation research. And this is research that is often used to evaluate the effectiveness of social policy. If the research is intended to produce policy recommendations, it is called policy research. And here's two of the larger ones. So Institute for Women's Policy Research and the Border Policy Research Institute. Um, one of the biggest examples of this in the past 10 years or so is the advent of drug court instead of sending drug addicts to jail where they just get worse. Um, drug court involves going to rehab, it involves going to tents, uh, to the AA or NA meetings, it involves going using community resources, and essentially what it's doing is treating somebody with a drug problem as a patient or as somebody who has an illness rather than as a criminal. And this is all based on research that's been done in the last 20 years by a variety of scientists on the concept of addiction. So that'll finish up today's lecture. If you have any questions, please email or text me and uh, I will talk to you later. Have a great day.